And if we go into final preparations now, where we're get, getting the last bit ready before we can start building packages. So here, as you say, as a root user, we're going to create create a few um, default directories. So if we look at the LFS directory at the moment, all we've got in there is our sources directory, and of course, inside sources are sources are all the files we've just downloaded. And what this does here is this will create some extra directories and it'll also um, create an additional directory for 64-bit. So if you're compiling for 32-bit, this command would have no effect. So it doesn't matter if you copy all of this in or not. Um, whether, whether you're on 32-bit or 64-bit, just copy the whole lot in it and it will work as, as it should do. And as you can see, it's created these directories in the LFS partition. And lastly here, we need to create a tools directory. And this is for the temporary tool chain. So the tools won't be used for the final system. It's only used for the interim system that we're going to create. Now we're going to create an LFS user. Now these multiple commands, you've already seen me just copy everything in the gray box. It's advisable not to do that. It's advisable to copy them one at a time run them just to check the output in case there's any errors that appear you'll either get nothing come back like this one which means the command was successful or sometimes some commands have a minus v for v verbose and it'll it'll be telling you what it did and the one you don't want to see is when there's an error and that'll be immediately obvious there'll be you know warning or error or something like that appear but by doing these commands one at a time it allows you to inspect the result of that command if you copy and paste loads of commands in one go, it's hard to discriminate between the commands and the output, especially when you have a distribution such as this one that don't highlight the prompt. So it makes it harder to pick out uh, where the command is when you look back on, you know, on the terminal. So we've created a group for LFS. We've now added an LFS user. We need to set the password for the LFS user so that we can log into it. So I've created a password and now it says give LFS full access to all the directories under LFS and it's given this, this permission to do this for this first stage while we're building the temporary system. And also it says to change the ownership of the sources so it's got access to the sources as well. So you can see if we look at the sources directory now, keep on doing that source. Um, oh yes, it was just the directory. Yep. Uh, yeah, Linux from scratch. That's right. Um, so this also prevents, by the looks of it, the LFS user from deleting these files, which is what I've done before. But what um, it might be a good idea to do is, if I show you these files the root well anybody can read them so you can see the owner which is root can read them um, anybody in the root group can read them and anybody else any others can read them as well and it's only the owner that can write to them so what I do here is I normally do chmod um, u minus w on all these files because sometimes when I'm in root I do delete them and I think off the top of my head if you try to delete one of these files without that flag setting I'm pretty sure it, it asks you are you sure uh, you want to override these permissions so if I now do a listing you can see these files are read only basically by everybody by the owner the members of the group and anybody outside of that group so it's just a little bit of safety. Sometimes I have been known to delete them by accident. Then you've got to go through the rigmarole of downloading it and validating it and so on. So the next thing I'm going to do is to actually become the LFS user by running this command. Because we're root, we don't need to know the password. Um, 
but if you were to log in from another account then it would ask you the password obviously. Now we'll create some uh, basic environment configuration files for the root user, just copy and paste these all in, all single commands, even though they're multiple commands, they all, they all act as one command. And there's, again, there's explanations about all the um, configuration commands and so on that you used. Um, this box is important. It says that some distributions configure Bash in a certain way that's not compatible with Linux and Scratch. So you can just run this and it does a test, And but depending on that test, it will make a modification. Of course, it does say as root, you need to run this. So we need to come out of root again. Paste that command back in. If I highlight it again. And if it does something, because there's a V switch here, it will display something. If it doesn't display anything, then you know it hasn't done anything. Yeah, you can see here it has done something in my case, so it was necessary for me to run this uh, command to make it more compatible with Linux from scratch. So now I can become the Linux from scratch user again. Just run that command again. Um, it's unnecessary now because I've come out of Linux from scratch user, but we can just run this anyway, just to make sure we've got the latest configurations loaded. Uh, this next part is all about static uh, build units, I think, a uh, standard build unit, sorry. They used to be called static bash units years ago, and I still think of them like that. Uh, it's now called a standard build unit, and basically what it is, is how long the first package takes to compile uh, there are guidances on how long all the other packages take to compile based on that one. So if, for example, the first package takes five minutes to build in total and you come across a package that says it takes two SBUs to run, then the guide is that that, that build will take twice as long as five minutes, i.e. it will take ten minutes. They're not wholly accurate. It depends on lots of things, what process you've got, how much memory you've got, uh, how fast the processor is, how many cores you've got, all this sort of stuff, how fast your disk is even, whether it's a mechanical disk. So they're not um, accurate, um, but they are a good guide. It will certainly give you an idea of whether um, you can sit and wait for the package to complete in a few minutes or whether you're going to uh, be waiting hours for, for a package to complete. Um, if you've got multiple cores, then this is a good thing to set. And in fact, it's probably a good thing to set in the um, bash RC file. So if we do vi um, home directory, right, this is set up as the American keyboard, unfortunately, uh, forward slash dot bash RC. And just add in at the end here this export. So yeah, I've, my processor's got four cores. So J4 is what I'll be using. If you've got a processor with two or six or eight or whatever cores, just change it for the number of cores you want Linux from scratch to use when it's compiling. I'll need to resource that uh, change. If I do set now, just look for make flags. It should be there. And there it is there. So that's been taken on, and that means that make will use that where, where necessary. <clears throat> There's a bit about test suites here. In the temporary part, don't run test suites because um, it's a temporary uh, environment, and also the host may not have the correct temporary tools installed. But when we come to build the actual Linux from scratch uh, system itself in chapter 8, I think it is, uh, it's highly recommended to run them because it's the only way of knowing that the programs that you have built are of a good standard, are of good quality and haven't got errors in them, basically. If you didn't run the test you would, and the, the compiling compiled and went through, you would have that doubt all the time of whether the binaries you've produced are, of, are actually of any use or not. Um, and if, for example, you were to get weird things happening with your system, how would you know if it's something you've done recently or if it's the core programs that you've built originally when you built the Linux from scratch system that, that caused 
uh, those anomalies. So it's very, very recommended. Takes a lot longer to build the system, admittedly, but um, you get that guarantee, peace of mind, that you've, you've built a, a good system that's going to be stable and uh, won't give you any trouble.